high in the night sky above the nation's capital, down flashes a shooting megastar on a mission of mercy. Zeroing in on her rooftop helipad, bearing priceless gifts of caring and sharing, she touches down to touch the hearts of her celebrity guests who tremble in anticipation in her luxury penthouse below. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Dame Edna Experience with Dame Edna Everidge. <laughs> it's thrilling for me. It's a marvellous opportunity. After my last excellent series, many moons ago now, London Weekend were begging for more. They were on their backs with their feet in the air. They said, do it again, Edna, they said. They were panting for more, but I said, sorry, call me old-fashioned. I said, but if I do another one of my excellent shows, I'm not making it in those yucky London weekend studios. I'm sorry. <laughs> that pongy tower block, that whippy carbuncle on the south bank. <laughs> I said, if I do another one of my excellent series, I'm going to do it in my own home. <laughs> in my own luxury penthouse. <laughs> with my house guests, not just jet-lagged folk drifting in. <laughs> no, people who stay with me, who use my guest towels, who <laughs> rub through the little personals in my jacuzzi with a nail brush. <laughs> and then after the show, they whip straight up to bye-byes. And that's what's happened. Of course, London Weekend are over the moon. They've agreed to anything. So here we are in my own apartment. Of course, we had to ensure that there was maximum security. We've got all kinds of devices to protect my celebrity guests. I even thought of getting a Rottweiler dog, but I decided <laughs> I'd rather stick with a slobbery old New Zealand terrier. <laughs> I refer, of course, to my old friend and bridesmaid, Madge Allsop. <laughs> Madge. <laughs> darling. Madge, darling. Ooh. Don't encourage her. Look at that. Wearing an apron on the show, Madge. Look, Edna, lovely. That's wishful thinking, isn't it? <laughs> but of course, they couldn't fit the word abominates on that <laughs> narrow little bodice of Madge's. Off you go. Take it off, for heaven's sake, Madge, will you? Oh, isn't this exciting? Well, we've got a wonderful lineup of people on this show tonight. We've got a royal lineup. We have Washington royalty in the person of. Ronald Reagan Jr. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> we have Hollywood royalty, Lord Sir Douglas Fairbanks Jr. <laughs> we, have, we have Henry Fonda Jr. in the person of Jane Fonda herself. <laughs> and we have rock and roll royalty, the legendary Chubby Checker. <laughs> and last but by no means least, royalty, royalty, Her Royal Highness, Princess Michael of Kent! <laughs> well, excuse me. <laughs> hello? Hello? Hello, it, it's Douglas. Oh, who, who is it? Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. Yeah. <laughs> He must be on the ground floor. Did you get the shopping, did you, Dougie? Well, I couldn't get chicken, but I got cutlets. Oh, oh. give me strength. <laughs> All right, darling. Well, bring, on, bring them up. Bring my shopping up. We're peckish up here. Well, the lift is out of order. 
What's wrong with the stairs, Douglas? Well, it is very four flights. I've seen you in the film shinning up the rigging like a rat up a drain. I've seen you jumping off stuccoed balconies and clinging to lithe lianas with a cutlass in your mouth too, darling. Put the shopping bag between your teeth and pretend the cutlets are a cutlass. <laughs> Bye. The exercise will be good for him, I think. <laughs> I seem to get younger, don't I, Pop? <laughs> well, last week I received a very exciting postcard from little ex-Washington friends of mine, a delightful couple. Uh, dear Edna, our little boy is coming to London. Please look after him for us. Love and kisses, Ronnie and Nancy. P.S. Please cherish him. He's the only member of the family we're still talking to. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I decided to take that little boy under my wing very much. I've made him at home. He's staying with me at the moment. Without further ado, may I introduce the charming Ron Reagan Jr. <laughs> Make yourself very much at home, as you, you have, my darling I have, I have Ron. Been, and I, my mother is so grateful to you for, you know, putting me up. She, she sent over this, this copy of her book. Oh, her my book! Turn, yeah. Isn't this lovely? My turn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a lot of pages, too. Of course, my mother has turns all the time. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> funny turns, but she never writes about them. <laughs> It'd be a shelf full of books, wouldn't it? But it's very brave of your mother to write about hers. It's fascinating and illustrated, too. Well, one good turn deserves another. My gorgeous autobiography for you, darling. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to hang on to this because my folks already have two copies, oh, actually. Okay. Yeah, kind of a his and hers. His has got a cute little rawhide cover on it. Oh, so. lovely. <laughs> Bless him. Bless, I'll write in it later for you, my By darling. By the way, you need uh, new towels in the guest room? Yeah. Remember that, Madge. New towels in the guest room, please. <laughs> you, should be, you should be cleaning your shoes. Well, I was going to manage the shoes after, oh, after the shoes. Just put them yeah. outside the yeah. room. Madge will fix them. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, this is quite an apartment. Isn't it lovely? It's yeah, beautiful. And much more comfortable than a television studio. Madge, the badge, please. We have little badges in case I forget your name, Ron. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> fix, Madge. <laughs> <laughs> There we are. Oh, Junior. Great. <laughs> Let me look at you. Just freeze. In this light, who do you look like? Your mother or your dad? Uh, what do you think? I think you're your father's boy. I do. You're a Ron boy. <laughs> you're certainly <laughs> not a Nancy boy. Uh, you're not. And I, uh, I must say, I have to say this. That, I mean, all the family seem to be leaping into print. Two sisters, a brother, your mother, and I believe your father is dictating his memoirs at the moment. Or as far as I know. Or whatever yeah. he does. Have you any plans at all for leaping um, into print? No, not for, for that kind of a book, well, anyway. I'm very, Maybe. very uh, glad. I, I must say that I think, you know, it's enough. It must be the most chronicled family in the history of America. My family, unfortunately, have disappointed me very, very much. I have to tell you this. I have a daughter, Val May. You're in her room, as a matter of fact. You yeah. might have noticed the graffiti on the ceiling. I wondered about that, yeah. And it doesn't the seem to go with the rest of the... Uh, yeah. and the restraining straps on the bedpost. <laughs> Those came in handy, though, actually. Oh? Yeah. <laughs> yes, one yeah. case you sleepwalk, I suppose, Ron. <laughs> Val May is a disappointment to me. I'm sorry. She, she wrote a book called Edna Dearest, rather along the lines of Joan Crawford's daughter. Oh, she portrayed a gorgon, a monster. Nothing like me at all. She's paranoid, too, I'm afraid. Oh, there was a terrible... Hmm? Legends like you and, and Joan Crawford, I guess, have a hard time with it. It is difficult. I know it must be difficult growing up in the shadow of a legend. But you've had run-ins with your parents about your career decisions. But they pass these things. I think... It's almost a biological necessity, Ron, that at some stage in our lives we disappoint our parents and 
we are disappointed by our parents. It's a spooky little thing, and I've noticed it's it. A yin we, yang we kind of yin thing. Yang. I can tell you come from the West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> but your decision to be a dancer. Now, that was a big one, an important one. What was the allure of the dance? What drew you to it? Well, sex. I don't know. It's uh, dancing. No, you've, you've danced. I've seen I you dancing do. with uh, Rudolf Nareda, who did. actually was the first uh, person I saw. He was on this show, I know, little Rudy. But... He was a little bit D-I-F-F-I-C-U-L-T, I have to tell you. <laughs> Well, he didn't make... I mean, I think he should have moved into another sphere a little bit early. I know I shouldn't say this, but I say it caringly, Rudy, in case you're watching. Every time he jumped, his little bottom jumped a second later. <laughs> I have to say, I think he might have passed his sell-by date. I think he might have... Spooky enough, when he was working here, or doing my show, working is hardly the word for it, when he was doing my show, I peeped into his dressing room, he wasn't there, and there was his posing pouch <laughs> over the back of a chair. Yeah. I peeped into Rudy's posing pouch. What woman wouldn't? <laughs> and there, there was a little label which said, Best before September 1975. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, know. you were spectacular, though, dancing. Well, you moved like a cat, I have to say. Talking really. of cats yeah. and creeping things. Let's see how Dougie's getting on. <laughs> Dougie. He's climbing the stairs, there he is. poor there darling. He is. <laughs> Isn't he wonderful? 22nd floor already. 22nd at his age, yeah. too. He's 80 marvelous. years old, and he's With barely broken shopping. sweat. <laughs> Bless you, Ducky. He's marvelous. <laughs> well, he looks better in black and white, don't you think? <laughs> However, be that as it may, back to you. You gave up the dance, I think almost at the right time. You know, it's a, it's a question of when to move on. And you entered a new sphere. What mm. was it? Well, I started writing for a while for magazines, and then I got into television, which is what I'm doing right now. Lovely in the States. Yeah, yeah we were just in Moscow, as a matter of fact. Oh, what a so this is quite a culture oh, shock. it after. must be, darling. Sort of a bourgeois fantasy Oh, and here. you've had some nice meals since oh, you've been it's here, a, yeah, too. It's, it's a real culinary town. It is. Right? Glasnost is moving slowly, isn't mm -hmm. it, Possum? Yeah, it is, it is. It's, a, it's a sort of a depressing place, but one thing you realize when you get there is that they're not going to take over the world. No. no way are they going to take over quite the world. a while, I don't think. Maybe little bits of the world. I don't know. Maybe like the hot dog concession at Yankee Stadium or something. <laughs> That's really probably the extent of it. Haven't I a delightful guest? <laughs> <laughs> You've entered the sphere of infotainment. What exactly... Well, Ron is infotainment. Well, it's a hybrid, I guess, an information entertainment, which uh, Americans seem to confuse a lot these days. We've got news programs that have recreations of, uh, of news events on them, which is a little scary, you a little overwhelming. Well, recreate yeah. news events? Yeah. Seriously? Uh, seriously, Like air well. crashes and things? Well, <laughs> once they sign Spielberg and uh, yeah, his team, I think they're going to move right into that. Well, it's a new industry, isn't it? Is. It is. And a it little spooky. I've got a word for that, Orwellian. I think I used that just a second ago. That's yeah. where I heard it. Yeah. <laughs> Orwellian and viewers, you're going to hear that word, a lot more of that word in weeks to come. <laughs> I suppose now that your family are out of the White House, there's a sense, a little bit of family relief, you know, perhaps yeah. a little normalcy can take over. And, of course, you don't have this tight security all the time. No, no. That can be a bore. It, it can be, although I, it, it's very, uh, it's not very noticeable here, because I know you have a... It, but it's here. Yeah, yeah it I know. I feel here. safe. I feel this safe. This place is riddled with booby traps. <laughs> I, I noticed It is. Security me. systems are everywhere, because I don't want gate crashes. Heaven help! People who try to gate crash this beautiful show of mine. Yeah, the, the camera over the toilet, though, was a little bit... I don't know. I felt embarrassed. Well, you should put a blanket over yourself, I guess so. <laughs> Maybe Madge could leave a... Yeah. Yes, Madge could. Please, hello. It reminds me. Danny. Hello, darling. That's the family. Arm all security devices, please. <laughs> yes, yes, please. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Just to be on the safe side. <laughs> any gay crashes in my eagle's nest, Ron. <laughs> no. um, your family. Now, they're not in the White House. Did they leave anything behind for those new gate crashes, George and Barbie Bush? <laughs> <laughs> I know when we leave a home, 
for people who take over. It's Sometimes true. you leave it's a little true. bit of soap in the shower, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Did they leave a bit of toilet paper? I think, I, I think my father left a few Louis L'Amour paperbacks laying Lovely. around. But, and uh, perhaps a tube or two of Grecian 2000. <laughs> Barbara. For little Barbara Bush, <laughs> let's hope she knows what to do with it. <laughs> or shall we say, let's hope she uses it where it shows. <laughs> no, please. <laughs> Trust my audience to misinterpret everything I say <laughs> and twist my words, Ronald. Um, do your parents miss the limelight at all? Yeah, I suppose. You know, once you've been the center of the universe, more or less, it's, it's tough to, to kind of come down from that. Of course, you wouldn't know, since you're sort of still there. Well, I've not stepped out of it yet. I, that's, that's... <laughs> but uh, it's a big adjustment for them, isn't it? Are they it having is. therapy for it, it at all? <laughs> no, although that's not a bad idea, really. It isn't. <laughs> I'm all for it. And may I say, you are a credit to your therapist, my darling. Thank you. Well, <laughs> you are. It's taken years, yeah. But... Are they plagued by social climbers? Well, it's, it's funny that when you're in that position well, in the White House... Talking of climbers, oh, yeah. I wonder how Dougie's doing. <laughs> my surveillance camera... Sh oh, look at him. He's still back. <laughs> Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. Oh, he's on the 33rd floor. He's doing well. Oh, he hasn't even slowed down. He hasn't even had a comfort stop. <laughs> he's dropped the oranges, the clumsy... Oh. I can't reach him, you see. There's no sound on my security system. But he's still upwardly mobile. <laughs> Marvellous, isn't it? I'll just dog here the dirty bits. Oh, it's not really. It's a bit raunchy Jane here. Edna. Jane Edna, I've made it. He's made it. Douglas Fairbanks Jr. Recycling the junior badge. <laughs> Saving the forest. <laughs> there we are. Thank you. Make yourself very much at home. Good. <laughs> now, I'll just give you a little mop up. You're very, very hot and sweaty. I'll adjust your little Windsor knot there. <laughs> yeah, darling. Off with a lippy. <laughs> You old swashbuckler. <laughs> Your swashing days are over, though. You're starting to, starting to buckle a bit on those stairs. <laughs> oh, dear. But, Douglas, you must be used to the rough and tumble now. You've done so many strenuous roles in your career. Oh, great many, yes. Over a long period of time, though. You know, it began when I was 13, so it's a long time. Well, we won't do our arithmetic, but that's a fair while ago now, isn't <laughs> it? it? Is. <laughs> <laughs> do you do your own stunts? You know, all that swinging and climbing? I'm afraid, yes, most of them. Broke a lot of bones doing it. Oh. Curiously enough, I, I did get uh, into the war, and I was in in for the service for six years, and I was in combat five years, never got a scratch. Oh, yeah. But I had all bones of my hands and ribs and leg broken, all just doing movies. Well, Much I'm more not dangerous. in the war. Well, we must thank Hitler for sparing you. <laughs> I never thought... It's spooky, isn't it? I never thought I'd be saying, thank you, Adolf, for giving us <laughs> Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., uh, more or less in one piece. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it must be strange, though, mustn't it? Perhaps not to you, but to us, for a boy to have the same name as his father. I mean, it was exactly the same name as your daddy, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Yes, yes, it was. Was it, a, was it a weird feeling? Was it a close relationship you had with your father? Well, I, I, having lived with it all my life, I don't know whether it was a weird feeling or not, except when I sometimes uh, went out for a job, I kept thinking maybe I ought to change it. But uh, by that time, there would be so much publicity about the fact that I'm going to change it didn't really matter. But uh, we were brought up separately. My family had divorced when I was young, so uh, I, I didn't see him enough when I was that young to um, 
really be influenced. That must have been a bit of a sadness in your life, Douglas. Well, it was sad for other people. I wasn't really aware of it until later. And then, then I probably was sort of um, wistful about it. Yes. Did he ever... Was there a moment of, that you can remember? Did he give you anything? Any special present that uh, you can remember? Yes, yes. He gave me a cigarette case once on the first night of my first play. Oh, and then he gave me a pony. He gave me a pony, uh, which I loved very much, but he had just, uh, the pony's name was Terry, as I remember. And, uh, but he had just come back uh, from a trip to Japan, where he was very heavily and wildly and beautifully entertained by the then Crown Prince of Japan, and thought he ought to give him a present of, as a gesture of thanks. So he took my pony away and gave it to the Crown Prince oh. of Japan. Oh. <laughs> Hirohito, Hir yes. Oh, dear, poor little Terry. He's <laughs> <laughs> a teriyaki by now. <laughs> Denied. <laughs> but, uh, I'm at the height of my powers, as a matter of fact. But, uh, according to my gynecologist. <laughs> it's sad all the same. It's a little bit traumatic, isn't it? Did you ever discuss with that, that, that with your therapist when he was alive? No. <laughs> well, Stanley, you escaped from, you escaped from your family. Yeah. into a very early marriage, didn't you, Douglas? Oh, it did indeed, yes. I, uh, I was, um, I defied the wishes of my family and went and got married when I was 19 for the first time. And who was the lucky girl? I don't know how lucky she was. Uh, Joan Crawford. Oh, you old name dropper. <laughs> <laughs> wife dropper. I oh, wife dropper. <laughs> jo it's spooky, this, you know, Douglas, because my son, Kenny, is the president of the Australian Joan Crawford Fan Club. Oh, really? Yeah. And you're the founder member, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, well, the emphasis on member, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> Be that as it may, Joan, well, you came to the parting of the ways, as we do yeah. in human relationships. Yeah. Sorry, but we do call me old-fashioned. <laughs> I think I can say this now without fear of successful contradiction. Joan became a bit of a rat bag, didn't she? <laughs> I mean this very nicely. I did. She had some funny little ways. Oh, yes, she, uh, she's a very nice, normal, hard-working, dedicated girl. Uh, but she always liked to use uh, substitute words for, 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 for things, you know. Oh, uh, what, for example? Oh, well, one thing that immediately comes to mind in this sort of funny line, like children do have, uh, they have uh, what they call double dutch and other things like that. Uh, I remember she used to call a kiss a goober for some reason. Don't ask me why, but it was an in invention. Goober. Yeah. Goober. Yeah. Oh, sounds a bit yucky, word, doesn't it? it? No. Sounds like something you'd have trouble getting out of a chenille bedspread, doesn't it? <laughs> on a piece of paper and give it to the dry cleaner, I would. <laughs> what other little phrases? Intimate oh, phrases. Oh, my heavens, I don't know whether... Um, I don't know whether I should repeat them on the air oh, or not. Oh, yes, no. yes, we're not. No, I don't really remember. No. no. <laughs> Did she have, well, making love? Did she have a funny word for that? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Only you would think of a subject like that. Well, I keep my I'm mind a on a romantic person. I see, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I keep forgetting that. Yes, probably <laughs> so long ago. Did she have a funny word for her front body? Word. <laughs> well, she sounds a very interesting person. <laughs> and, uh, and you knew her at a very interesting stage, my darling. Yes. Then Douglas Fairbanks Jr. went on to a number of famous romances. Gertrude Lawrence? Gertrude Lawrence, yes. I had, we were uh, friends for quite some time. Lovely. I was going through a stage when Girls who were just a little bit older than I were always more attractive. You know, young men are usually attracted to older ladies. 
and they're all about two or three older, years older than I, and I thought that was wonderful. It made me feel what older. What was it, experience, or...? Oh, I don't know, I suppose. It was something like that. It Romance. made me feel more responsible yes. and more macho, you know, when you were very young. Well, it's obviously worked, hasn't it, possums? <laughs> there was Marlena Dietrich, of course. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, and your wife. Oh, that was something quite else. That was wonderful. That was a long-term wonderful romance. Something last. very, very different and yes. something wonderful. Yes. Yes. Lasted nearly 50 years. Madge is an older woman. <laughs> you don't have to say anything, Douglas, but does she turn you on? <laughs> You're I'm going to tell you later on. Later. Yeah. <laughs> so, I want to express this delicately, but you are, you are an older man now. It must be harder to find older women. Where? <laughs> oh, please, don't twist my words, studio audience. Where do you, where do you cruise? I mean, Twilight Homes or... I mean, instead of being a stage door Johnny, perhaps you're a north porch Johnny. Well, television studios. Television studios. <laughs> There's a few old timers still in television studios. Mm. But one of the essences to me of your appeal, and it's still very vibrant for me, is that famous moustache of yours. Oh, that thing. Well, that little <laughs> wisp above your orifice. <laughs> now, wow. it's, it's significant, and you know, it's very much a thing of a certain epoch. Um, David Niven, of the well, 30s, the late 30s. He, well, he did. He copied you. I think he copied was. you. Hmm? He copied you in a way. Oh, that's in very a flattering. Nice way. I doubt it, but that's oh, very flattering. Well. The moustache, though, Ronald Coleman had one. Yes, yes. And. Uh, Errol Flynn had one. Well, that was much later, too. Yes. Yeah. Clark Gable had one, but yeah, he was but he, bigger. Off and on, yes. <laughs> off and on. Yeah. He used to take it off from time to time. <laughs> um, and a lot of people, you know, Hitler, Eleanor Roosevelt, <laughs> they all, all had moustaches, didn't they, in the late 1930s? Well, oh, sometimes, sorry. Sometimes shave it? Sometimes shave it, but then people don't notice. That's the trouble. I try it, and even in front of my own children, my own daughters, I said, see anything different? And they said, oh, your hair is parted differently or something like that. Oh. And they, um, they don't notice it's on or off. I know. Often when Madge has a depilatory, I don't notice either. <laughs> <laughs> Be that as it may. <laughs> <laughs> We're having a ball here on the Dame Edna Experience with Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. A friend of many people, loved by everyone, too. The reports that come back to me are very affectionate. Uh, and... A man in the world of show business who is certainly the equivalent of royalty. Talking of which, um, I wish to introduce now a member of the royal family we all adore, arguably the most popular royal in the world, who began life in Sound of Music country. She learned her ABC <laughs> in Sydney, Australia. <laughs> and to me, she's just plain Mary Christine of Bondi Beach. <laughs> <laughs> to the world! Princess Michael of Kent. is fine. She's as happy as a sandboy. In fact, she's very impressed with my security arrangements. She's going to have the whole thing installed in Kensington Palace, so all's well that ends well. My next guest, Douglas, is uh, to the twist. What Strauss was to the waltz, what Bellin... Excuse I. Hello? Dame Edna, it's Jane. Jane who? Jane 
Fonda, I'm supposed to be on your show. Can I come up? Oh, Jane, darling, lean back a bit. You're distorting on my entry phone. You look a bit like a reflection in a spoon. <laughs> Jane, Linda, can I come up, please? I'm here to be on your show. Oh, my darling, Jane, tell me about your new picture first. <laughs> Down here? Well, I'm dying to hear about it. I can't wait. Dame Edna, I'm here to talk about Old Gringo, my, oh. my new movie, but I'm supposed to do it upstairs on your show. Oh, Bingo, that's the one uh, with Meryl Streep. Gringo. Bingo. Gringo. Oh, Gringo. I see your old Gringo, and I adore it. <laughs> Please, would you buzz me in so I can come upstairs and buzz talk you? to you the way it was supposed to happen? You darling woman, I adore you, Jane. What are you wearing, though, Possum? <laughs> I'm wearing. Yes, what is that that I can see? I have a gray flannel designer jogging clothes it's on. It's all what you gray. Want me to is it just as well I didn't no, invest I on a color bench? <laughs> oh, lovely. Bright look, turquoise. It looks a bit hot and sweaty, <laughs> Jane. <laughs> I'm entertaining. I have company. I have got people. <laughs> All the way from the United States to be on your show. It's been advertised that I'm going to be on your show, oh, and you're Jane, kicking me out I know. of the building because are I sweat my... This is the first <laughs> in-depth interview on an interview. And Jane, we have a dress code, Possum. I cannot let a woman have a dress code. That's You're a, calling me possum. It's a and you term of endearment. On your show. It's a term of endearment, <laughs> Jane. Don't snap at me, Jane Fonda. <laughs> well, I'm terribly sorry, but come again when you've got a nice frock on. I, I don't believe this. Larry Hagman is a friend of mine, and he warned me that I wouldn't be able to find Bye. anywhere in England a smile of your caliber. But I never. <laughs> was I before I was rudely interrupted by that rather casually dressed little madam downstairs? <laughs> My next guest is an innovator. What Strauss was to the waltz, what Valentino was to the tango, Chubby Checker is synonymous with the twist. Ladies and gentlemen, the legendary Chubby Checker! Madge, for heaven's sake. Oh, darling. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> Thank you. I feel safe with you, Chubb. <laughs> I couldn't resist it. No. I have to say, I have to say, Douglas, this man is the perfect house guest. Yeah. You've been staying with me a couple of days now, yes. Chubby, and you've made your own bed. You clean the bath after you. Yes. And you helped with a meal the other night. I bought those chickens and you cleaned them personally. You, you whipped those giblets out as quick as Jack the Ripper. He did. Well, I have, I have uh, association with that. Have you? Well, I, I plucked a few chickens in my time. In the early days before yes. you were a star? I, I got discovered doing that. Did you? I was singing and plucking and cutting. And, and they took me to the studio and because I sang so much. And um, I got very lucky, and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm on TV, and I'm, I'm, in, I'm on the records, and it all happened with the chickens. So when I was doing your chickens the other night, I was so happy. It was a beautiful, beautiful place. It overlooks London, and I'm, I'm the laundry. This is your Lots second home in London. I want you okay. to regard it as that, Chubb. Well, <laughs> well, Jane, up. I feel privileged. Thank you very well, much, Well, you Thank know, you. at least you've gone to a bit of Thank trouble. You. Thank you. <laughs> you have not a lot of trouble, but a bit of trouble. <laughs> How would an off-the-shoulder look suit Douglas, do you think? <laughs> Mind you, you used to wear one of those shirts, didn't you? And yes, a little hanky knotted on your head? Yes, it was made of sword, Jean. And a sword. Lovely. Chubby, I suppose when you were at that conveyor belt plucking those chickens as a kiddie, it might have been a bit cold. You might have instinctively started doing a little <laughs> bit of that to keep warm, do you think? <laughs> well, 
begin? Well, it, it sort of, I saw some children in the neighborhood doing a, a kind of a dance, and there was a record out by Hank Ballard, and um, I was asked to record this record. And we gave it something else. We gave it instructions of putting out a cigarette with both feet, coming out of the shower, wiping off your, your bottom with a towel to the beat of the music. <laughs> And bingo, things happened. They certainly yes, did. They and yeah. it's beautiful to talk to a legend who is still pretty youthful looking. Oh. You are, my darling, <laughs> and, and happy, a beautiful mood, and a lot of humility, as both all my guests have tonight. Um, <laughs> have you ever done a twist, have you, Dougie? And not in a very long time, no. No. My husband, Norm, well, he was an invalid. But he did the twist naturally, you know, just in his sleep, really. <laughs> he used to tear the sheets to shreds at night. <laughs> Mind you, how many times would you say you've done it? That's a loaded question. Um, probably, I've done the twist more times than I've made love. Well, you keep count, do you, chubby? <laughs> Well, why don't we do it, possum? Can we? Let's do it. All right. Okay. Yeah. Give us a pun, Doug. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Come on, Edson. Let's do the twist. Now? 